Hey out there, legal warriors. What are the steps to a domestic violence case? And I'm talking about from the defendant's point of view, from someone who's been arrested. What's going to happen and what are the steps to expect in navigating the process? If you're interested in this area of the law or if you or a loved one are in this type of situation, stay tuned because this is the video for you. <music> My name is attorney Lance Fryer. I'm a defense attorney in Linwood, Washington. My law firm's been defending people charged with crimes for more than 20 years. And I'm putting out these videos to help educate the public. So if you find this useful, please like and please subscribe. More people will get the help they need. Now I'm just gonna jump right into it. What are the steps to defending or going through a domestic violence case in Washington State? And that is a tough situation to be in but the steps are pretty identifiable and I want to cover those here so you have some idea of what to expect. So how does a domestic violence case start in Washington State? Well, almost always it starts with an arrest, right? Somebody calls the police and if the police show up and believe a domestic violence crime happened within the last four hours, especially an assault, they're required to make a custodial arrest and take someone to jail. Sometimes it doesn't start with an arrest, sometimes the suspect has fled the scene, and instead, uh, whoever the defendant is is going to be sent a summons to appear in court. In any case, um, there is going to be a process that happens post-charging and a process that happens pre-charging. So let's start with the arrest situation. If somebody gets arrested for a domestic violence crime, they will uh, have a court date but they may or may not be charged with the crime yet. It depends on where the arrest happened, what the jurisdiction is. It's different in every jurisdiction, which means you know the geographical area where the crime occurred. And it's also different for the level of crime. But for the most part, think about if it's a non-felony and a city police officer, typically a city police officer can file their own criminal charge into court. And at that point, the first court date is gonna be called an arraignment. And an arraignment is where you enter a plea of not guilty and then they set conditions uh, for the case to go forward. If it's a felony charge or if it's a county police officer involved, usually a sheriff, uh, very rarely state patrol for domestic violence, um, then those uh, felonies, police officers can't file their own charge, they can only arrest someone for investigation. And for county police officers, the prosecutors don't want them filing their own charge. Uh, they can only arrest for investigation as well. So if it's an arrest for investigation and not a full on charge yet, then the difference is the first court date isn't an arraignment, it's a first appearance. To that first appearance, the court's gonna determine whether or not uh, the defendant should be held on bail to protect the public where they have to post money to get out of jail and they're also likely going to issue a no contact order saying the defendant can't go home. And for the most part of first appearance, the conditions on a first appearance only are good for three court days. But you need to contact an attorney because as I say again and again in these videos, defense is very local. One court does things one way, the court across the street actually does do it a different way. It's not just hyperbole, it's the truth. Um, so you need to contact an attorney. But let's say the case gets filed and we're at an arraignment. An arraignment, we have a filed case, and then we say not guilty and the court sets conditions, including possible bail and most likely a no contact order. So what does that mean? Well, at this stage of the proceedings, the defendant is likely gonna be ordered to not have any contact with the alleged victim and not to go home if that's where the fit happened at their home. Not to go where the victim lives, not to go to their work, uh, possibly not even to see their own kids. And so it's a big deal. And how long is that no contact order gonna last? Well, it's unknown, but think about it, usually as long as the case lasts, which could be three months, six months or longer. The default amount of time is gonna be written on the order is gonna, it's gonna say five years, okay? That doesn't mean it's gonna last five years, okay? That's just a default time so the court doesn't have to keep reissuing a pretrial order as the case goes on. If they only issued an order for three months, if the case went on four months, they'd have to issue another order at the three month mark, right? And that's just extra work and they don't wanna do that. So you say not guilty and then um, basically you get assigned court dates. So um, what do you need to do? Well, hopefully you've, you're going to find an attorney 
The most important part of this process is to find a criminal attorney, either if you, if you can afford one, look around for a private attorney to help you because they typically have more negotiating power than a public defender does. Um, the reason for that is a public defender has so many cases, the negotiating power uh, declines, in my opinion. Um, and if you can't afford a private attorney, make sure that you apply for a public defender because a public defender can still do a very good job, right? Um, the more you help the de public defender help you, hopefully the better the outcome will be. But you need yourself an attorney. You cannot face this type of charge on your own. You're technically allowed to, but no one would advise you to. Um, so after you've been through the arraignment, they're going to set something called a pretrial hearing. And a pretrial hearing forces the defense attorney and the prosecutor to acknowledge a case exists. You are part of that hearing by showing up in court, typically, either on Zoom or in person. You know, I'm filming this, you know, in 2022, um, after some COVID restrictions have been lifted. But you have to show up, but you're, you're there, but you're not really actively participating. You're gonna need to acknowledge things to the judge um, because usually what's gonna happen is your attorney is gonna ask for another pretrial hearing to continue to negotiate the case. So you might have to answer, you know, hey, I understand what's going on and I agree. But there's going to be a pretrial hearing, and there's usually going to be multiple pretrial hearings until there's a resolution. So what about that no contact order, Lance? How can I get rid of that? Well, it's not really up to the defendant to get rid of the order. Um, the protected party often does want to get rid of the order, right? They usually didn't ask for it. Um, and so the alleged victim is oftentimes going to be in communication with somebody called a victim's advocate. The prosecutor is not the victim's attorney. The prosecutor rec rec uh, represents the government, okay? So, and the victim's advocate is not the victim's attorney. The victim's advocate is supposed to uh, communicate sort of information to the victim about, you know, how the procedure works, and then also communicate back to the prosecutor what the alleged victim's wishes are. And, you know, in my opinion, there's good ones and bad ones out there, but but most victims advocates will take their job seriously and hopefully just advise and communicate and not um, try to influence too heavily what the wishes of the alleged victim are because oftentimes they're wanting to uh, you know, have the defendant get some help, get some treatment, but they don't want their, their lives ruined because they have a life together, right? So um, how can an order get terminated, you know, short of those five years, short of the, until the case is over? Well, um, in most courts, the alleged victim can file a request for a hearing. It's usually done in writing saying, hey, I want to change or drop the order. And if that happens, um, usually in most courts, the defendant is going to be required to appear at that hearing as well. And so ask your attorney, but what the court is often going to look at besides what the victim says is, hey, what has the defendant done to change their position between the time the order was issued in arraignment and today when there's this request to drop the order? If the defendant has done nothing, has, not, has done no classes, hasn't done DVMRT or domestic violence evaluation or anger management or alcohol classes, if that's involved, if they've done nothing, then it's very easy for the court to say, nothing's changed. So my order stands, okay? And even if a defendant has done something, still what matters even more than what the defendant's done is how long has it been since the order was issued? Because it's a human being making the decision, right? The judge wants to protect the victim and the judge wants to protect him or herself because if they drop that order prematurely and something really bad happens to the victim, they're gonna feel really bad about that as humans. Right? And they're also going to naturally be worried about what effect that might have on them being a judge in the future. At least that's my opinion. Um, you know, I've, I've done some substitute judging and, um, you know, as a normal human, we worry about the people in front of us and we worry about ourselves too. So the order may or may not get dropped, may or may not get modified, but that is how that part of it works. So there's going to be multiple pretrial hearings and eventually there's either going to be a resolution set or there's going to be a trial set. If you get to a trial, then you're gonna be much more involved as the defendant. You're going to get to see the people, the police officers who testify uh, against you. 
Uh, there may be medical experts who testify. There may be a 911 tape that gets played. There may be photos. And then your attorney is going to have a chance to cross-examine people. And then you'll have a chance to testify if you and your attorney think that's best. Um, most cases don't get to a trial. Uh, we always try to avoid cases getting to a trial because once a case gets to a trial, we no longer control the outcome. And in my opinion, many juries want to convict people, especially if they're going all mad nowadays for about COVID and politics and everything else. So it's best to control the outcome in our uh, point of view if we can. So if the case gets to a resolution, um, what are the types of resolutions available in the domestic violence case? Well, a nice one would be a dismissal, right? You've done enough. Uh, uh, your side of the story has been heard. You've done enough classes. The alleged victim has made his or her point clear, and the prosecutor says, okay, I'm going to dismiss it. That's the best outcome, right? Other outcomes could be what I call a slow dismissal, an SOC, a stipulated order of continuance. We have a video on that, which you can like at better. An SOC is a, a contract between you and the government where if you do certain things like affirmative conditions and you avoid certain things like new crimes, then a certain result will happen in the contract, oftentimes a dismissal. So there's a court cost, usually things like that, but it's not a conviction. Um, if you screw it up, then it turns into a conviction. So that's what the prosecutor gets out of it. And finally, there can be pleas, there could be reductions, there could be lots of things that happen, but at a resolution hearing, you would expect that you're gonna have more involvement. You're gonna need to talk, you may need to talk about a little bit about what happened. You're definitely gonna wanna cover it with your attorney about you know, what to expect in this particular court, with this particular judge, with this particular prosecutor, um, so you're best prepared uh, to help your case uh, in an effective manner. So the, the steps of a domestic violence case are pretty much like a no normal case, uh, a non-domestic violence case, except for that no contact order part. It's important that, um, uh, typically it's important in my opinion, that people get working on things quickly as a defendant. Doing classes and things is not an admission of guilt. It's not usable against you. Uh, in a criminal trial, they can't say, well, uh, this person did anger management classes, so they must be angry. No, that's not allowed under the evidence rules, right? So. So um, just, you know, jump on what you need to do, get a hold of an attorney, um, pay attention to court dates, don't violate no contact orders. Those are the things uh, that you need to, to pay attention to in steps in a domestic violence case. So if you found this video useful, please like and please subscribe. More people will get to see it and that's important. And then uh, if you're in a criminal situation, if you're facing some type of charge, feel free to give my office a call. Again, my name's Lance Fryer. I'm defending people charged with crimes. For more than 20 years, you can always just reach out, we'll listen to what happened, we'll identify a way forward, and we will be there for you. Thank you.